So what if you build an AI robot and that AI robot just happens to injure someone or even possibly kill them? Of course, that would just be an accident, but it wouldn't be intentional. But the thing is that if you, if, it seems like it'd be really important to be able to, if giving the same inputs to that robot, the robot would do exactly the same thing again, which is kind of ironic because you wouldn't want it to kill someone again. And also the system that you use to generate the robot, the, the AI robot factory, you'd want it to be able to produce exactly the same robot every time. By having those things, you would be able to exactly reproduce the problem so that you could actually debug it and solve it. So today I'm gonna to take you on my own personal journey through solving this te difficult technical problem. I'm gonna show you some of the most common causes of non-determinism in deep learning. And I'm also gonna introduce a new methodology and a new tool set which I've created to be able to debug these kinds of problems. By the end of this talk, you'll also know what we're releasing in terms of uh, fixes and solutions for this, this problem. <coughs> So I'm going to talk for 40 minutes, then I'll take 10 minutes of questions, and let's get started with randomness. So the thing about randomness is it's actually really important for, for deep learning, and we use pseudo-random number generators all the time because you know, we need to do random mini-batching so we can do st stochastic gradient descent. It's actually really important to do that so that we can uh, use a smaller data set to get a, a more robust model. We also use pseudo-random number generation to create to, to, for data augmentation so that we can do the same thing, to have more training with less original data. And of course, this makes the, the model more regularized and more generalizable. And of course, this thing here is wondering, maybe wondering why there's a cat here. This is just a random cat. <laughs> now, before I start going into digging deep into this, I want to define what I mean by determinism in deep learning. So what I mean is the elimination of truly random effects, which is what this is. This is a, a, a pictographic representation of eliminating non-determinism. Truly random effects and getting a bit exact reproducible output from your system from run to run. Now, when you're training a model, that means that at the end of training, the model has exactly the same weights, which is kind of a miracle, right? I mean, who, who could expect that would be possible? And then when we're inf inferring, if we give it the same input, we should get exactly the same inference. And if we're generating graphs like with TensorRT, we should get exactly the same graph, given all the same parameters. So at the beginning of this project, I also set some goals. And one of those goals was to make sure that the, the result had reasonably high performance, because we need to be able to run it, you know, and run it quickly and, and performantly. And also, we want to be able, I wanted to have it so that people wouldn't have to change their models, that it would just work out of the box. Now, there's got to be const some constraints on this, and like, you know, it's, it's very challenging to, to get this anyway, and so the requirements that I'm going for, at least for this project, was to get to the point where any of these things could vary, and potentially it could introduce a change in the behavior, but with all of these things the same, the determinism should be guaranteed. Now, the advantages of, of getting really true determinism in deep learning, there's several of them. The first one is auditing. How many people in the audience work on uh, robotics or autonomous vehicles. Raise your hand. Yeah, there's quite a few of you. And how many people work on in, in healthcare and medicine and, and uh, that kind of stuff? Medical imaging. So yeah, there's, quite, there's probably like 50, 60% of the people in the room are, are working on that kind of stuff. And so yeah, that's, I mean, this is very important to be able to, like I said at the beginning of the talk, to be able to go back to the beginning and find out why something went wrong so that you can fix it and debug it. And there are, there are all kinds of requirements for that. The second one is debugging, which is kind of related, but I have a couple of stories about this. One of them is a team that I, I know was working on a, on a relatively big model that they were training over a period of two weeks. At the end of two weeks, um, the model, like the gradients exploded or something and it stopped working, and then they went back to rerun it. They instrumented it, went back to rerun it, and they couldn't reproduce it. So now they had this kind of lingering bug that they couldn't track down. The second story is that I built a CUDA a CUDA kernel library for TensorFlow, and I was playing with it, and I noticed that when I changed this initialization parameter that shouldn't have changed the behavior, it seemed like the uh, accuracy, the perplexity of this, uh, sorry, the accuracy of this model was slightly different. And I thought, that's really weird, but I couldn't actually determine if there was a bug. So I had to run it 25 times one way, 25 times the other way, and do a statistical analysis to determine if I had a bug or not. 
So when you can reduce the variance to zero, then you just have to run it once, which is kind of like what we're used to normally in software engineering. Another um, advantage is experimentation. So, you know, we're doing this, this is a lot of this is data science, right? And science involves holding all the, all the independent variables st stable and then changing the one you want to test, do an experiment on. So there, I, I know of a group that was doing an, an enhancements on model architecture and various other things. After a couple of weeks, they'd made some improvements and progress, but then they realized that the amount of the variation due to the non-determinism was actually greater than the improvements that they were getting through their work. So they had no idea whether they're actually improving the model or not. It's kind of like having a, petri, a set of Petri dishes where they're all randomly seeded with different types of bacteria, and then you have to do your experiments on top of that. And then the last advantage that, that I want to mention is regression. So the story I have for that is uh, I was looking at the code for uh, an LSTM cell in the TensorFlow models repository, and I was thinking, wow, that's really weird. Like that piece of code, it looks like what would happen is that when you have multiple layers in the LSTM, you would get the same weights being used for all the layers. And so it turned out that that was actually a bug. And, it, and so with just two layers, as they had in the regression, the amount of variation in the, in the output was so small it didn't show up. So they just shipped the model, they shipped it. Somebody put a bug in there they didn't realize if you took that cell and you it deployed it in a 50-layer model, then you would have all these GPUs whirring away, training this massive model that has very few parameters, and you wouldn't even realize, necessarily. So this is a graph that I just wanted to put in here because it kind of summarizes what I just said, and I took a while creating it. It's kind of a bit nerdy, but um, sh just showing the, the, this distribution of model accuracy against the probability of the accuracy, you get kind of a Gaussian distribution. And so this might be how your model operates. And then you say, well, OK, I'm just going to say this is the correct range for this. And then you make a change, and now here's this other distribution, and you have no idea that you've actually changed the, the true mean or the true behavior of this model. And you've actually made it worse in this case. So actually, when I first started working on this project, there were all these people uh, said, would say different kinds of things. It's amazing how many beliefs people have, and they really believe them. And now I can see how they're totally not grounded in any kind of data or knowledge. So TensorFlow is inherently non-deterministic. This belief that somehow there's this magical thing inside TensorFlow, that this little gremlin that makes things non-deterministic. There's also a belief that GPUs are inherently non-deterministic, which is a similar gremlin. It's the same gremlin, actually, or it's his brother. Um, somebody told me this problem can't be solved, which is kind of amazing, because they've just solved it. And actually, the person who said this still tells me this can't be solved, which is, I don't know how that works, but I said, just tell my boss that. And then the real killer is nobody cares about it. So it's like, oh, this problem can't be solved and nobody cares about it. So that's kind of a bit depressing, you know, like to, to be able to keep going. So it took a lot of effort to keep driving to, to, this, to this resolution. And then uh, there's this belief that non-determinism is required for high performance, which it's, I don't think it's really true. And you'll see from the numbers, it's, it's not really true. And it's easy to just set the seeds. Well, it's, actually, that doesn't work. So I just did a brief kind of like looked at everything, talked to various people, did a survey using the internet, just checked out what was out there. And this is some of the hypotheses about what the sources of non-determinism could be. And uh, I found this great blog post from Two Sigma, which uh, I should stop looking up there. I can look here. Um, where they basically point out that the, the, the time this blog post was written, these two ops were non-deterministic in TensorFlow on GPUs, reduce some and, and, uh, and add. And so they, they, they came up with this model level workaround that uses uh, MATMOL. And I'm not going to go in detail through these slides, but um, I, I spent time creating them. And they, they're pretty good descriptions, visual descriptions of what they did. So you can look at them in your own time. But basically, the, the thing is that now, these two ops are now deterministic. So all of that effort was a complete waste of time. <coughs> So then I was like, OK, well, what I should do is just solve a real problem, I actually take a real situation, a real model, and, and make it train deterministically. So this was in the context of our project Maglev, which is an at-scale machine learning platform. And this is a, so I took a 2D uh, object detection model for autonomous vehicles. This is production scale, millions of parameters, millions of training examples. And uh, we're just going to, and so, um, Yeah, OK. So I just want to uh, plug this. This is one of my articles that I published. This is 2.3k claps. You should go and read it. It's awesome. It's a summary of how to debug problems. This was a difficult problem, and I used the principles from this article. Um, so, But just in a nutshell, how to debug a problem is to determine what is working, to determine exactly what is not working, 
and then to generate hypotheses and use divide and conquer. But the problem with TensorFlow is, first of all, it's very hard to divide and conquer in the first place, at least without eager mode. And then also, um, it's necessary to figure out what's changing between runs rather than just what's changing during a single run. So this is a, a diagram of, of kind of what a forward, uh, a non-recurrent neural network uh, kind of si situation looks like, where there's a data loader, a model, and a loss function. And I wanted to be able to insert probes into these various places, into the trainable variables, so you could look at what they were before training, after every training step, and at the end of training. At the end of training is like the measure of whether the whole thing was deterministic. Various points in the input pipeline, after each forward um, op, in the loss function, and also in the back prop into the weights. So to do that, I developed a determinism debug tool. And so what you do with this tool is you just insert it into the graph at the places you want to probe. And then you run the graph twice, and it literally tells you exactly where the non-determinism has been injected, which makes the whole process a lot easier. And we don't have to sort of just guess and say, oh, I think it's this thing or that thing. It's literally, it, it shows you it's that op or it's that, the back prop for the particular op. So it's pretty easy to use. You just import it. There's a little bit of initialization, which isn't shown, but then you just put the probes in line like this, um, and then in, in, your, in your data flow graph. So usually in, in graphs, um, there are all these different kinds of data structures flowing through the graph. And so what this tool does, it splits the data structures out, all these different kinds of uh, structures into until it gets down to tensors, and then it inserts uh, probes or monitors on all the tensors, then it packages it back up again and sends it back into the graph. So for example, you might have a list of named tuples of elements in your input pipeline. Um, and also it's back, it has to be backpropagatable so that it can uh, pass through the backprop. So some other types of monitors are uh, for monitoring Keras at the output, uh, the output from Keras layers, for monitoring gradients, as I've already said, and also for summarizing trainable variables. And also, like, it seems like everyone does training with TensorFlow slightly differently. And so um, it worked with TF Keras, with regular Keras, with, with, um, with TF Estimator as well. This is what the output from the tool looks like. This is super geeky and nerdy and sort of like not very good U UI. But basically, you can see that this is the first run. This is the second run. This is, um, each of these is a point in the, in the data flow graph. This is uh, the sum of weights before training. This is a point in the input pipeline a point at, coming out of a Keras layer and a gradient. So this is like deeply compressed and summarized with, with some things chopped out of it here. Um, but these are, these are the hashes of the tensors at each point. Green means they match, red means they don't match. If you look at this, you can see the input pipe. First of all, the weights before training match, which is really important, because often that's a problem. If they don't even match before you start training, then you, they're never going to match. And then you can see the input pipeline matches. There's the first two steps in the... Um, in this, this forward pass, which are deterministic, and then the third step is non-deterministic. And then you see this gradient where it goes non-deterministic on the second step. So this is, this could be, if you saw all the data, this could be the place where it's being injected. And then once non-determinism gets injected into a deep learning pipeline, because it's a, recur it's a, re it's a feedback loop where um, uh, the data gets stored in the trainable variables, and so it kind of propagates and spreads everywhere. And so you have to find the first place where it's showing up, and then from there you can, you can fix that and then, and then re reveal more um, sources. So the first source that I found was convolution, and particularly the backcrop to the weight gradients. So I'm just going to briefly show you why or, or what the problem is. Um, and it's going to take a few slides to explain this, but you have this uh, very small, relatively small input filter, um, which then feeds through to produce a really large convolution output. Now, when you start backpropagating the gradients, um, what happens is that there's a, a reduction that happens into these, the, the, into a, a gradient and all of these elements gets reduced into a very small number of gradients, uh, of elements here for the, for, for the gradients. There's also a problem with backprop to data gradients, so the, the backprop that's going through the chain uh, all the way back through the pipeline. And so you have, for example, here uh, an input with a relatively small number of channels. This might be the red, green, and blue channels in an image, for example, and it's outputting producing an output which has many channels, so many filter maps. When you get the gradients at this point, um, when they, w w in the backdrop, they need to be reduced into this relatively smaller number of, of gradients, small number of elements. So usually, this isn't actually how it happens physically. Um, th this, is, this is a logical description of how you kind of do backdrop, these, these massive calculations in backdrop. So you do a, 
um, two very large, it's essentially logically like two massive matrix modifications. They get broken down as these pieces. This piece is done on, on one thread block and one, on one CTA. This is done on another thread block and another thread block. So these are all done on se in separate thread blocks asynchronously. And when, they're, when all these partial results are produced, they have to be summed together to produce the actual gradients. Now, the way that's usually done is, is with CUDA Atomic Add. So I'm just gonna run through briefly with CUDA Atomic Add. Who, who's used, who knows about this? Raise your hand if you, if you know a lot about CUDA Atomic Add or Atomic Operations. There's quite a few people here, okay, cool. So uh, forgive me, I'm gonna just briefly go through it as quickly as I can. So um, we have two warps here and uh, they're running, gonna be running in different thread blocks on different uh, SMs. And these represent threads in those two warts which want to uh, sum into this memory location. So let's say that warp A goes first and does an atomic add and adds five, then you get six in the memory location. The atomics unit will, will go to memory which is close to it, either the, the cache or, or go all the way to memory. It'll do the addition, you get six. Then warp B goes and you get, it adds four and you get 10. Okay, now, the thing is it could happen the other way around. Um, B could go first, it adds four, the atomics unit adds, the, adds that, gets five, and then warp A goes and you get 10. So you get the same result. So that's the magical thing about atomics is you always get the same result and you don't get weird, weird kind of results because of race conditions. So the benefits or the advantages of CUDA at Atomic Add or any of the atomics is that it serializes operations without stalling the threads. It assures the atomic read write, uh, it assures an atomic read write of memory, read modify write of memory, which avoids race conditions. It's super, super easy to program, and um, you don't need to synchronize between thread blocks. So it also can be faster as well because you don't have to um, get the data from memory, pull it all the way to the SM, and then work on it and send it all the way back. You can just do it very close to memory. So um, the real issue with this is that when you start doing uh, floating point arithmetic in different orders. So, so A plus B is usually equivalent to B plus A on, on any particular hardware architecture because our floating point um, add is, or floating point arithmetic is usually commutative. But if you add A and B and then add C, that's usually not equivalent on most architectures to adding B and C and then A because for each addition there's a rounding error and the rounding error propagates differently um, based on the ordering of the, of the additions. So the root cause is, is this CUDA atomic add. And, um, but there's also a, a potential issue with TensorFlow because it, it auto-tunes the kernel. So it chooses the fastest kernel available um, in order to do the convolution. And so I added this uh, TF CUDA and deterministic um, environment variable to TensorFlow, which uh, switches off auto-tuning and selects the deterministic convolution backprop kernels or, or algorithms. And that's uh, in this pull request to the main uh, master branch. And it can be enabled in your uh, shell script um, like this, or it can be enabled in your Python script like that. Okay, at this point, I've cleared away the convolution issue. Convolution backprops now are working deterministically, and it reveals the next thing, which is, which is bias addition. And so let's just quickly go through that. It's a very similar uh, situation. We have a very small single value per, per, per output channel um, for the bias, and that gets added to, to the output from the convolution, which is relatively large, and you end up with this, uh, during the back propagation, you end up with all these gradients, one for each of these many, many elements being reduced into this single element here. So this operation, this TensorFlow operation, uh, uses atomic add. And the temporary solution is to dynamically patch that operation, and uh, Using, using different TensorFlow ops which are deterministic. So here's the code. It's pretty simple, but I'll just leave it here in the slide so you can look at it if you want. But um, we have a patch that we just basically import and then apply the patch using dynamic programming. So at this point, um, that revealed even more sources of non-determinism. So fused batch norm was non-deterministic. Every, now every 10 steps, before it was every single step of training, now it's every 10 steps we're getting this happening. And temporary solution is to run it on the CPU. Now, Running, that's kind of the default thing, is if it's non-deterministic, run it on the CPU, and then that'll clear it. That's the solution. But with this one, it, it, may, it significantly impacted performance. 
um, and also the passing back and forth between CPU and GPU memory plus uh, just the algorithm running more slowly. Um, so that revealed the next uh, source of non-determinism, which is gate gradients, which is, a, uh, uh, um, which, which, which is passed into compute gradients. So this is happening every 100 or so steps. And so gate graph um, is, a, is, so gate, this, basically TensorFlow has different ways of calculating gradients with varying levels of parallelism. And gate graph is guaranteed to be deterministic because it's totally not parallel. So at this point, now, this is, now, now we get to the point where there was non-determinism being appearing every few thousand steps. And it was at random locations in the input pipeline, like all over the place, places where it just couldn't be that op that was causing it. And so I thought, well, maybe I have a hardware issue. So I changed from a Pascal card to a Volta card, and exactly the same non-determinism persisted. And I, I went to dumping the, the contents of the probe tensors into files and analyzing them and looking for the exact differences. And I found that in these massive tensors, you had these sort of like um, a, a particular column of the most innermost dimension had these completely random um, insertions of numbers. It wasn't a, because of round, floating point rounding, uh, rounding anymore. This was like, looked like some kind of bug or something. And so, um, you know, I suspected that ten it was the way that TensorFlow passes the underlying memory between allocated tensors in time or in, in location. Um, and after a lot of time debugging that and learning about how TensorFlow did that, I ran it on, the, on a cluster, and it ran completely deterministically. And this was like, oh my god, what the hell? Like, how does, how, uh, what could it be? Oh, it's just the driver. The only real difference was the driver. So I updated to the most recent drivers on my local machine, and it was fully deterministic. So there are all these possible causes, like, um, like interface trims, clock speeds, all these different things. I have no idea what it was, but there was this, this, this lurking uh, driver bug, which people were presumably tra training massive models with, and they were getting some extra regularization from. So it turns out that w with this as well, the batch norm solution and the gate gradients uh, solutions were not required. So presumably, these were um, exacerbating the other issue. So those could be uh, disabled. So now at this point, we had, um, I had an autonomous vehicle model training fully deterministically with a million, or millions of examples. Um, I had this tool that had been developed for uh, determinism debugging. And, uh, also, tens th th this, this uh, upstreaming of part of the solution to TensorFlow. So here's a look at the performance. So like, you know, so we got uh, deterministic and non-deterministic. They're very close. In fact, it turns out there's only a 6% decrease for running deterministically. And this doesn't seem like much. But then also, this is, without an un uh, this is with an unoptimized bias add solution. So potentially, these could be pretty much equal. So the whole story that you know, um, first of all, the story that it's not so, that it's an impossible problem to solve is not true, and also that you need non-determinism for, for performance is not true. So then I went moved on to multi-GPU, and uh, in this particular project, we we're using Horovod for uh, for that. So starting with the single GPU determinism recipe as a baseline, you have to have determinism on the single GPU first. Turns out the two GPUs were deterministic straight away, but for G more than two GPUs, uh, it was non-deterministic. So we're just going to dig into that a little bit now. So Horovod uses nickel to ring all reduce. Ring all reduce is, a pretty, uh, is now a common algorithm for doing reductions across multiple devices where you have the ability to set them up topology, topologically as a ring like this. So uh, I'm just going to give you a brief uh, run through of ring all reduce. So this is, uh, these are four GPUs. Each GPU has uh, one quarter of the uh, trainable variables uh, that it's cal calculating gradients for. Each GPU also has one quarter of the batch. And so what happens is that each GPU is calculating the, gra the partial gradient for one quarter of the batch. And then it's passing it around the ring. And um, after three steps, then, then there will be a complete average reduction of the gradient for each of these pieces of the trainable variables. So, th so after each training step, there are these three reduction steps. Step one looks like that, step two looks like this, and step three looks like this. At the end of step three, all the GPUs have um, the fully reduced uh, gradients in them, ready to be applied to the trainable variables. So here's the paper that, that, that uh, explains this in more detail. Now, the thing is that Horovod uses tensor fusion. And so uh, what that does is it batches together the, the gradient values, the gradient tensors, before sending them around the ring, which improves the performance. But it also improves the performance because it uses the, the interface more efficiently. But it also seems to mean 
that, it, uh, that the reductions happen in a different order every time on every step or at least on every run. And I was talking to Alex uh, yesterday about this and, um, and we're gonna try and look into this in more detail, but it, it doesn't seem like it should be a problem. It should be, be possible for it to be deterministic. So for now, the solution, the interim solution is to disable tens tensor fusion, which you do like this. And let's take a look at the performance. So this actually is what you would expect. This is what Uber might publish um, because the, the, literally the only thing that's being switched on and off here is tensor fusion. You can see um, this kind of expected scaling to two GPUs and tensor fusion is switched on. You go to four GPUs and you get this kind of like suboptimal scaling. Then tensor fusion switches on, you get non-determinism and you get a bit more performance. And then you similar stories for eight GPUs. There's also a very, there's also a strange amount of difference between the perfect scaling amount and the, um, the amount, the performance we're getting, and I don't really know why that is. It might be some characteristic of this particular model. So at this point, um, so GE Healthcare contacted us and was, was, were needing to be able to train deep learning models deterministically. Um, and uh, they, they were using this, Edison, they used this Edison platform that they have, and they were needing to train on 2D data like x-rays and also 3D data from advanced CT and MR machines. And, um, you know, bit, oops, bit accurate determinism is not only important um, because th this is a healthcare application, but also they need to be able to have it in order to develop these complex models and to be able to do hyperparameter tuning. Um, so they gave me a really boiled down model with just, uh, with some max pooling and, and uh, 3D max pooling and 3D um, convolutions in it. And I used the, 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 the debug tool that I developed to isolate and identify the, the, the next source of non-determinism, which was max pooling. So I'm just gonna quickly go through how max pooling works. Um, the, the, the pooling window selects the maximum value and in the input. And as it slides across, in this particular case with a pitch of one, you see it selecting um, the max value at each point. And in this example, this is the kind of problematic example. Again, you see something very small going into something potentially very large. So you have uh, this three gets broadcast to all of these output uh, elements. And so then in the back prop, you, those need to be reduced to, uh, to produce this one value. And so, um, so some of the max pooling algorithms were using atomic ad and they were introducing this random ordering of, of um, reductions of additions. So again, this environment variable that I added to TensorFlow in the master branch uh, selects the uh, deterministic max pooling algorithms. Actually, so the thing is that QDNN already had um, deterministic algorithms for max pooling and convolution. It's just they weren't being exposed in TensorFlow. And in fact, inside NVIDIA, the people who are writing kernels generally are very keen on, 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 on uh, determinism. And so there's usually deterministic versions of kernels um, of algorithms. So the enabling of it's the same as before. Okay, so while I was doing this, I happened to notice that um, there was like an enormous amount of variant. That, there was actually non-determinism in the CPU when it was running on the CPU, and the variance was much, much greater than the GPU. And it's kind of like, wow, this whole belief that CPU training is always deterministic was completely blown out of the water. And um, I could use the tool to identify it was in the in the wait update step. And so the solution is to use a single CPU thread. And this is a good thing to know. Just if you want to, um, if you see non-determinism on the CPU, you can just switch to a single thread. Um, and you, you, you don't need this when running on a GPU. Okay, so this is what the, the, the kind of the output looked like. Uh, running on the CPU, running on the GPU, you can see the amount of variation in these values. This is the sum of weights at the end of training. Basically all the digits are varying on each of these runs and then um, the, the final loss value is mostly changing apart from the most significant digit. On the GPU, it's much less variance. And then also, I, I trained a bigger, I set up a bigger configuration and trained it uh, a couple of times. And you can see that, um, you know, the CPU took 67 seconds and the GPU took 2.4 seconds. This is partly because this is a single thread and this is, you know, tens of thousands of threads or, you know, even possibly, not in this particular case, but hundreds of thousands of threads running deterministically, by the way. So um, at this point, I want to just want to summarize the complete recipe for determinism, training TensorFlow determinism deterministically on a GPU. So you set this variable, uh, which, which I've added to TensorFlow, and this does these three things, which I've already talked about. 
and then uh, dynamically patch by a sad. Set all the, the random seeds, of course. You know, that's the important one. Don't forget that. And uh, then if you're using more than two GPUs, disable tensor fusion. OK. Let's have a quick look at TensorFlow and CUDA Atomic. So I just, what I did is just went in and uh, searched through uh, some, some, some release branches of TensorFlow and the master branch and looked for the word, looked for CUDA Atomics. And I found that Atomic Add is used in 13 different ops. So there are ops that still exist that are probably operating non-deterministically but aren't, either haven't been used in the models that I've looked at or they're, maybe they're not that important for deep learning anyway. Um, and there are also 10 other CUDA Atomic operations, including Atomic CAS, which by the way, um, you can implement any atomic operation with atomic cast, but it's going to probably be significantly lower performance than using one of these custom atomic operations. Uh, there's also the word atomic is present in 167 files in the, in the TensorFlow repo, although, of course, many of those may have nothing to do with CUDA atomics. And it's also worth mentioning that just because someone's using CUDA atomic operations, um, it doesn't mean that um, there's non-determinism. It's also, um, sometimes people use Atomic Add because it's super simple, but the thing is that uh, if you do it within the same thread block, it can be, it's actually super low performance because all these parallel threads then, basically their operation gets serialized. So uh, for that, you wanna use, inter you wanna use uh, shuffling. Okay, so I took a quick look at inference as well. Um, obviously inference is all forward operations, but um, so you probably don't need to use this, this switch for inference, although I was thinking about this today and I realized that um, if, there's, if you're using deconvolution, maybe I need to try this out on some deconvolution, net networks that use deconvolution, because they probably have some non-deterministic ops. Um, but you also have to disable the, uh, the TensorFlow auto-tuning, and it turns out there's already an existing switch for that, so you can use this switch to disable that. And finally, TensorRT. So they have like 500 kernels, and they're all, they're all deterministic, and they like go to great lengths to make them deterministic. But the thing is that there's, a, there's an auto-tuning mechanism which runs all the kernels on the particular architecture so that it can choose the fastest kernels to make the very fastest inference engine. The problem is that every time you run it on a particular architecture, you might get a slightly different graph with different kernels. So we're currently working on a feature to be able to um, build the same graph every time. And also PyTorch. People always ask, what about PyTorch? So PyTorch. Um, it's pretty straightforward in PyTorch. You have to set all the seeds, which apparently you do like this. I'm not very familiar with PyTorch, but um, they also have a switch already, which uh, selects the QDNN deterministic algorithms, and that covers this, the convolution and max pooling. But, uh, but I actually hear there are still some non-deterministic ops in PyTorch. So PyTorch isn't a magical solution. Also, we already have tons of models in TensorFlow, and, and our customers have a lot of top models in TensorFlow, so we need to fix that. So the plan going forward is to um, release the current solution in the NGC TensorFlow container so it can be available to customers as soon as possible. Um, this switch that I added to TensorFlow will be released in version 2.0. The, rele the, the release version of, of 2.0 is apparently the end of the year. There's going to be um, release candidates in spring, they say. They say spring. And then currently there's an alpha version of uh, TensorFlow 2.0 if you want to uh, risk it. And um, I would like to make the bias add op deterministic at the CUDA, uh, the CUDA kernel level for higher performance. Um, I'm actually announcing right now that I'm going to open source this. Uh, we're going to open source this determinism debug tool. Um, and I want to add a single switch for all of TensorFlow to make it deterministic, uh, to select everything that makes it deterministic. And also, uh, I'm going to work with Alex to make, the, to make Horovod high performant and deterministic. So the, another thing that came up recently as well is that deterministic, uh, so when, when doing reinforcement learning, if you're automatically generating environments to train your agent and those environments um, don't, aren't, aren't reproducible, then potentially you can get an agent that works, but then you can't actually produce the same agent. So being able to simulate environments deterministically on GPUs is also looking like it's becoming potentially important. I want to thank all these people. These are uh, people from some, t some inside NVIDIA, some outside NVIDIA. Um, they've helped me, they've ch uh, chatted with me, explained things, um, uh, answered my questions, sat with me, reviewed this talk. And done so, so helpful. It's amazing how many people have helped with this. And I um, also want to thank uh, Cindy Riak, who's my wife, 
who helped me to prepare for this talk, and um, she's really supported me through this. Okay, the takeaways. This is what I want you to take away from this talk. So neither TensorFlow nor GPUs are inherently non-deterministic. That's absolutely clear. And the root cause is this synchronous floating point uh, operations. So it's important to use CUDA atomic operations uh, super carefully and understand the effect they're going to have. And also remember that often there's already a deterministic kernel available. So this was a hard problem to solve, but it wasn't impossible. It took me a year to solve this problem. Um, I was talking to someone, he's like, oh, you burnt a year on this. And I was like, yeah, thanks. You know, that's, I feel great now. Um, so, and it's actually a really important topic. It's like some people, you know, one of the things I said at the beginning was this isn't important, no one cares about it. But obviously there's quite a few people in this room, so people kind of secretly care about this. You know, and it's like, and people don't really want to say anything. Like, ah, shit, this model didn't train, I can't debug it. But it's like, yeah, but it's just life, you know. So, it's... <laughs> So uh, there you go. I mean, um, it's actually solvable and it's solved. So this also, we've developed new tools for met and methodology for debugging. And um, I think it's really important as well to remember that automatic vigilance is warranted. So we just need to start building in, um, once we have de uh, not, uh, determinism, to be able to uh, automatically check that it remains. We don't accumulate. We get, oh, it's non-deterministic anyway, so we'll just like throw this thing in. And it doesn't matter that it's non-deterministic, and it all just piles on top, as you've seen uh, we ended up with. Although surprisingly, there wasn't, that, uh, there wasn't as much as I expected. So what I'd like you to do is watch this repo, which is currently existing. I got it made public this morning. All there is there right now is a readme file. Is a readme file. Um, but what will be there is this debug tool, and um, that will be released as soon as I can uh, get that done and make it acceptable as a, a piece of code with, with tests and stuff. And um, so follow that. And then also connect with me, uh, talk to me, come and talk to me. Uh, um, yeah, I'd love to have conversations with anyone throughout uh, today and tomorrow. I'll be here all of tomorrow. OK. And with that, that's the end of my talk, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Duncan, for that excellent yeah. talk. So we have now time for some questions. Okay, I see one hand at the end. 